Path to Paradise is funded in part by Public Financial Management Incorporated, America's leading financial and investment advisors to state and local governments, helping to finance the schools, roads, and public facilities of the 21st century. And by Solomon Smith Barney, a global investment bank with offices around the world, including Carlsbad, La Jolla, Rancho Santa Fe, and two in the city of San Diego. It's election time, and tonight we'll look at the issues that have potential for great impact on our region, and they have to do with land use. John Nolan, the urban planner whose designs for San Diego became the official plan in the 1920s, might be surprised by how we do things now. And even Kevin Lynch, who in 1974 co-authored a widely celebrated vision for San Diego called Temporary Paradise, didn't see this coming. But today, it's common, and it's called planning by ballot. If residents are not happy with land use decisions made by elected officials, they go to the voters in the form of initiatives. If the initiatives pass, they become the law of the land. This November, voters are called on to be planners for San Diego's East Village, for the region's backcountry, and for two housing developments in North City. Is planning by ballot a good thing? It's not a good idea per se. Uh, it becomes a necessity when people feel that their uh, legislators have become unduly influenced uh, by special interests, especially development interests. And so they feel that the only uh, possibility for them to have uh, growth uh, planned in a way that meets their needs is to uh, place an initiative on the ballot. No, I don't think anybody can really justify that any real planning happens in any, any initiative although good plans can go into initiatives. I think we have examples of both on this upcoming ballot. We've seen examples of both in past ballots. But the problem is you can't, we can't seem to maintain quality of life standards through the regular process. And so what happens is, is you try and set up checks and balances um, on these processes, and that's where the initiative comes in. I don't think it's a good idea, but in this case, we don't have a choice. I mean. It, I think it's the planning issues are very complex and uh, the vocabulary to even speak about the planning issues is very complex and so as a result how can you convey both the problems, the solutions, the vision, the means to get there, how it all fits together in a, a you know, logical and reasonable way for voters to understand. Well generally I think it's better if the elected officials do it. Uh, however, when, when there is uh, a problem in which elected officials are not responsive to what I think the, the desires are of the people and the wishes of the people, the ballot measures is probably the, the, uh, the uh, source of last resort. And oftentimes the initiative process it doesn't allow for a real analysis of the issues, for that balance, for the in information to filter through to, to all sectors of society to make informed, thoughtful choices. And that's the challenge with things like land use planning by initiative. It gets formulated down to sound bites and, and slick campaigns and I don't think there's winners in that arena. Under normal circumstances if you had uh, legislators representing the will of the people then you don't need ballot box zoning obviously. But if that ballot box zoning is a response to a public need and meeting a true public good then then that ba and it's a good plan and we can prove that it is uh, then it, it is the only way to, to act, and it's very timely. Timely it is, and we'll begin with the grandest of land use propositions, Prop C, the proposal to build a 42,000-seat baseball park 
in the East Village of downtown, an area recently known as Center City East. Historically, this, this neighborhood had a couple of different names. It was called um, Bayside or Bayview. There was an area called Rose Park. Um, and so over the years, as the city started to plan for this area, um, I think what they, they really kind of assigned Center City East as a place marking name that would hold the area as it transitioned from being largely a commercial and industrial warehouse kind of district into what was envisioned, which is a residential mixed use neighborhood. And so with more and more people moving in, with more businesses coming in, and people calling this place home, they didn't want to say, my home is Center City East. They wanted to say, my home is the East Village, which sounds like a place that you'd like to live, you'd like to visit, and maybe uh, go play baseball. <laughs> the San Diego Padres have launched a massive campaign to win support for a stadium to be built with public and private funds, and they're hitting hard on the theme of redevelopment. If this can become this, and this become this, then this can become this. The finishing touch to downtown's revitalization. The ballpark district, transforming 26 blocks into a family-friendly neighborhood with new hotels, shops, restaurants, and offices, thousands of new jobs, millions in new tax revenues, complementing the adjacent convention center, gas lamp, and waterfront. Proposition C, it's more than a ballpark. The plan would radically alter the texture of the neighborhood as described in this promotional video produced by the Padres. Located near San Diego's spectacular waterfront and adjacent to our expanded convention center, visitors will be welcomed by a feature unique to San Diego's ballpark, the park at the park. This neighborhood park overlooks the ball field and is surrounded by retail shops connected to the ballpark. The park at the park will offer a uniquely San Diego setting for pregame picnics, concerts, and outdoor recreation. Intimacy is the first thing you will notice as you enter the ballpark. From the park at the park, the ball field unfolds before your eyes. As you enter, the openness of the concourses will contrast dramatically with Qualcomm's confining tunnels. Looking back toward the ball field from the concourses, you will be able to see the field, whether buying a soda or simply taking a stroll. You'll especially be struck by the way the ballpark fits into the surrounding city. At the left field foul pole, the historic Western Metals building will be restored and will feature a restaurant, club, and sun deck all looking out on the field. From the right field seats, the skyline of downtown San Diego will be framed in the distance. And from the left field seats, the Coronado Bridge will loom up behind the ballpark. Year-round restaurants will look out on the ball field, the convention center, and the bay. Central to the plan is a long-envisioned link between Balboa Park and San Diego Bay, complete with tree-lined pedestrian promenades and a waterfront plaza. Private investment will pay for up to 1.2 million square feet of office space, new hotels, residential units, restaurants, retail establishments, and other attractions. The most ambitious redevelopment project in San Diego's history. And no one is more enthusiastic about this plan than CCDC, the Center City Development Corporation, which serves as the city's redevelopment agency. We needed a catalyst. Uh, East Village is about 350 acres by itself. That's a very, very large neighborhood. Uh, to give you an example, the first uh, acreage we started working in back 23 years ago was only 325 acres. And the catalyst for there was Horton Plaza. Uh, once we got the deal cut, once it started construction, all the other pieces started fitting into place. So we've been searching for several years for a project to, that could be that catalyst in East Village. And when we heard that the city and the Padres were talking about a ballpark, we raised our hand and said, you know what, we think downtown would be a good spot. And of course, then nobody agreed with us. But uh, now I think most of the people we've talked to have seen the wisdom of uh, providing that kind of mechanism for redevelopment in downtown. But to Nico Calavita, the catalyst isn't needed. And what is ironic is that the uh, area that is going to be, quote, redeveloped is an area which was redeveloping on its own without much need for government intervention or for the utilization of a tremendous amount of money, which is taxpayers' money, our own money. Well, good urban planning uh, will allow redevelopment to happen eventually, and we're looking at probably 2025 before we would get done. 
uh, and that's okay. That, that takes a lot more money to do it that way, and it takes a lot longer, and you probably won't get the synergism that something like the ballpark could bring to downtown. But many who live downtown reject this argument and have organized to oppose the ballpark. Well, I strongly, and Stop C strongly believes redevelopment is already happening here uh, in many different levels as well. Uh, we already approved a $216 million convention center expansion just across Harbor Drive from here, which is you know, less than five blocks from here. Then we've got the 10th Avenue Marine Terminal that's slated to be developed uh, very soon here in the future. And it's those things that will actually be building the hotels around here, uh, not a ballpark, because people don't come to San Diego to go to ball games. They come for beaches and Balboa Park and things like that. So there's really no correlation between a ballpark and hotels. Chris Michaels is a professional photographer who lives and works in one of the downtown lofts that will be destroyed if Prop C passes. You're looking at the kind of redevelopment that's been going on here at no expense to the city whatsoever. Uh, the CCDC invited people in here since 1992 to live and work out of these industrial buildings. Industrial buildings that can't, are not to be found anywhere else in San Diego. This is called a warehouse district, and it's somewhat of an arts district as well. Among the buildings targeted to go are the Artplex on K Street and the candy factory at the corner of 8th and K. To Michaels, they are part of a vibrant neighborhood, but others see this area as an example of urban blight. I think by our standards on the west coast it is. Uh, I think by Detroit standards or <laughs> other cities, probably not, but by our standards, uh, this is not the the quality or the caliber of neighborhood that we want, particularly for a residential community? According to redevelopment law, which is a state law, it is blighted. That is a, a legal term. Uh, do I call it blighted? Yeah, I hate that word. I think it's a terrible thing to call a neighborhood. I would be very offended if somebody called my neighborhood blighted. To me, it's, it's troubled. It needs some work. It's got some challenges in it. And that's the way we view it at CCDC. And that's a misconception. And I think it's uh, purposely done that so the people think that this area severely needs redevelopment when in actuality the area adjacent to the gas lamp is doing just fine. It's getting better and better every day. I've been here for nine years and see, seen it really change for, for the better. Most of the places look like MySpace does and um, they're very unique, one-of-a-kind places and it'll be a great loss to San Diego if these, these buildings, these historic buildings are lost. When you walk around, what you find, I think, in the East Village are pockets of beauty. <laughs> you have places like Merchant's Passage, where we are today. You have some spectacular, award-winning, um, home garden quality, you know, magazine quality lofts, um, some real treasures. But you have them next door to um, you know, a vacant lot that has remained vacant for years, uh, a, a building that, has, you know, that, that once housed an active business, but it left five years ago, and nobody is leasing that, that building. Um, we have a number of uh, homeless shelters in the neighborhood. You know, there are things like that that we have got to um, reverse the, the, the tide of decline, and, uh, and I think the ballpark is probably the best way to do it. I think there's room for redevelopment here, but it needs, that redevelopment needs to be done in the proper sense. Uh, the CCDC went out of its way last year to call this uh, East Village from its old name, Center City East. So I, I beg the question, how much village will be remaining if there would be a 42,000 person ballpark, uh, office towers, uh, high rise hotels, office park, and parking lots? Uh, where's the village in that? Project planning is a process by which you have plans by planners, by politicians, by big developers to go into an area and to wipe out everything which is there. It can be the street network which is extremely important for, for the vitality of the city. That is wiped out because you need that big building, in our case, a ballpark. So all that continuity, which is essential for the vitality of the city, would be lost. Not only that, you are going to have this huge building there, which then is followed by another huge building, which is the convention center expand, or e expansion with the existing convention center. So you, you wipe out a particular area. You wipe out all the buildings there either historic or non-historic building, which again represent the memory of a particular community. We don't scrape land and start over. 
we basically combine the old with the new. I mean, it's the character you want in a downtown. You, you want to blend the old with the new, and you want to be able to have room for the future, too. Ballpark supporters point to Coors Field in Denver and to Baltimore's Oriole Park at Camden Yards as examples of successful downtown redevelopment projects. I've had the opportunity to visit both Camden Yards in Baltimore and Coors Fields in Denver. There are not enough adjectives in my vocabulary to communicate the unique human experience each of the ballparks had on me. Suffice to say, it was more than a ballpark experience, and it was way more than a ball game. Watching the people at 615 in mass walk down the streets in blocks in Denver to attend a Monday night game, families, business executives, residents, all gathering to watch a baseball game, but also coming together as a community. Then after the game, on a Monday evening, the restaurants adjacent to the ballpark development area were filled. Our contemporary city mothers and fathers had the vision and fortitude to put a funky colored mall in the middle of downtown when no one ever thought they would wander there. This outstanding redevelopment project became the catalyst for the gas lamp, which has become the spirit of our downtown. The ballpark district has the capabilities of finishing what the city visionaries began, the heart and soul of the San Diego region located in downtown. The ballpark will be utilized perhaps 80 days a year. What is going to happen the other days of the year? Next to the ballpark, you're going to have offices, and you're going to have lots of parking lots and parking garages. You're going to have dead space. And uh, uh, have been at Camden Yards in Baltimore at night when there was no ball game going on. It was dead. It was completely dead. And this is what's going to happen to this area um, east of downtown or east of the gas lamp. The gas lamp has, tr has tremendous energy. So the, another thing which is wrong with this uh, proposal is that it's too close to the gas lamp quarter. A point echoed by Laura Kim, testifying here before the ballpark task force last summer. I would like to touch base on some land use issues which strangely have seemed to be removed from pub public dialogue. There's no good reason this ballpark should be crammed up against the gas lamp. The East Village area and historic warehouse district has been planned for 20 years to be a normal redevelopment district with housing and commercial redevelopment. The East Village, which is adjacent to the gas lamp, is already well on its way to reaching that goal. It is an area that is considered by most to be viable and historic. The East Village was not planned to be a mega venue for sports, which is incompatible land use to this area's original goal. If the Padres would have proposed to build this ballpark east of 12th Avenue, otherwise known as a truly blighted area of the East Village, maybe the residents, business owners, and smaller landowners of the East Village would have accepted and supported the idea of a downtown ballpark. The Padres have never had concern for the historic, cultural, and community resources of this area. If they had, they would have listened to what the community groups have been saying since a proposed location was announced in February. Other often heard concerns, parking and access. The city street grid will spread traffic out, easing arrival and departure from parking lots, providing over 17,000 spaces within a close and convenient 15-minute walk of the ballpark. The ballpark district is at the hub of San Diego's freeway system, with direct on and off-ramp access to I-5, Highway 163, or Highway 94. It is also well served by nearby trolley, coaster, and bus stations, making the district, according to traffic engineers, one of the most transportation-friendly sites in North America. Chaos. But Laura Kim uh, is skeptical. No park. People come down for the weekends, they have a hard time parking. And, uh, and if, you know, if the Padres are saying that you, know, you won't have any, any problems parking, it's a lie, because it's, anyone who's been down here knows how difficult it is during times of, uh, you know, uh, like events as the street scene or like during Super Bowl, it was chaotic and people just trashed the area. I think that the studies that are being published now are, are indicating that uh, downtown has the best parking resource in the county. I mean, we have over 50,000 spaces downtown today. The, the, one, the lots and the structures that are being planned to accommodate the specific parking of the ballpark um, 
are situated so that when you come in off of the various freeways, you're very close to parking, and then you're very close with a walk to the, to the ballpark, probably closer than you would be at Qualcomm, and probably you'll see a lot better scenery on the way into the ballpark. Uh, to me, it is probably the best access anywhere in San Diego for a ballpark. Even if Prop C passes, the city of San Diego and the Padres have until April of next year to back out of their agreement. And whether or not voters decide to let them build a ballpark here, Leslie Wade points out that the warehouse district, as we know it today, is unlikely to last. People that argue that the neighborhood should stay the way it is because there are businesses here that are productive and, and working kind of miss the point. And that point is this neighborhood is envisioned by the city as a residential neighborhood. Some of the businesses will stay, and particularly those that are compatible with housing. But the idea is for this part of downtown to become very much more dense, mid-rise, maybe even high-rise uh, apartments, lofts, condominiums with some neighborhood commercial around them. And the idea is that that will take some of the pressure off of the suburbs and suburban sprawl, which I think is another issue that's on the, on the ballot. Um, we're supposed to take a lot of the, the region's housing density in this neighborhood. So either way, as you look around, you're going to see taller buildings with different types of use in the future. We go now from downtown to the backcountry, the eastern flank of our region. Voters throughout San Diego County will decide on Proposition B, called the Rural Heritage and Watershed Initiative, that would affect some 600,000 acres from south of Orange County to the Mexican border. Supporters contend it would curb growth in the area by requiring minimum lot sizes of 40 or 80 acres, depending on their locations. Leading the effort is Duncan McFetridge, a longtime activist in land preservation. The Rural Heritage and Watershed Initiative, very simply, is the drawing of a boundary line so we can have a clear distinction between our urban areas and our rural areas. Right now, we don't have that uh, line or difference, uh, even though it's called for in the general plan. Therefore, uh, the rural lands that we know so well, we call our rural heritage, are open, uh, open season. Uh, for developers to take them at will and produce sprawl all over the backcountry. We need to do this uh, because uh, there are two reasons. One, it's a good thing to do. We don't want to become Orange County, Los Angeles. We can all look up there and see that. that that's very simple. Do you want to become like that? And the answer is no. Nobody does. We all pride ourselves on the quality of life we have. Well, we're just about to lose it. So it's a good thing to have this line. Uh, the other thing is, uh, most uh, very importantly, is that our group has been, uh, has detailed uh, in, in the courts and in planning processes that we actually, in our general plan, call for this line, uh, but it's only a facade, a masquerade, and, and our general plan, uh, even though it calls for growth management, uh, is really a great big loophole for development. But to the builders, Prop B would create bad public policy. It's, it's not an in-depth, thoughtful, comprehensive analysis of land use and how to plan for our future. It's been coined that, but in fact it is not that. It's a very simplistic approach. It simply took agricultural designations that are 15 to 20 years old and the existing general plan that guides the county, and it took those and it simply applied a massive downzoning. It took properties that could allow for one dwelling unit on four, six, or eight acres, and it downzoned those to 40 to 80 acre minimums. And those are currently agricultural land in some use or in some type, or at least zoned for that purpose. But there was no analysis done as to whether that was, you know, in current agricultural production, if it was economically sound or environmentally thoughtful, there was no economic analysis, no environmental analysis. It simply took existing designations and downzoned them. And the net effect is, if you will, sort of a de facto urban limit line. Yeah, uh, urban limit line is, is a planning line, uh, one, uh, to facilitate good planning in your urban areas and to put the rural lands off limits so that you're, you're not extending those urban type services into the back country, which I if you do that, uh, they can cost up to three times as much money and uh, deplete 
your urban areas where really important spending on schools, public transportation, in our case, uh, beach pollution needs uh, infrastructure spending to tackle that. So that urban limit line says, hey, here's a limit. We need to plan for these urban areas, make them work properly before we sprawl out uh, beyond that. Urban limit lines have been drawn in Portland, San Jose, and other cities but to Paul Tryon, yeah, they are not right for San Diego. San Diego's future. The decisions that this portends could affect not only existing San Diegans, but generations of San Diegans. And it's done without a comprehensive, thoughtful uh, approach to dealing with those balance of the issues. You know, how do we plan? Where will our population go? How about our, our housing needs? How about our, our environmental needs, our open spaces? The kinds of things that make San Diego a desirable community are not thoughtfully addressed in that. Not at all. First, we have to uh, recognize that San Diego is growing. Whatever number you pick, San Diego is growing. And the fact that it's growing from births, not immigration or in-migration, means that it, that it will likely continue to grow. And that, it's growing in jobs, it's growing in opportunity, and it's growing in households. And the reality is our industry right now is falling far short of being able to meet the housing needs that are being generated by the job growth and the population growth that we're experiencing. And all prognoses are that we're going to continue to suffer from, being, from a shortfall. The opponents say, we need housing in the backcountry. Okay, let's follow that scenario. What do you get if you put housing throughout the backcountry? You get housing for 4% of the population, 4%. But what is it going to cost you? You don't meet any housing need. You lose all your water resources. You pollute your reservoirs that we depend on for drinking water here. You lose all your wildlife. You add all those freeway miles. And you increase public service costs by millions of dollars a year. But you haven't met a housing need. So Here's the map that shows the impact of Prop B as seen by the builders. The gray areas are existing cities in San Diego are urbanized communities uh, within city limits. Um, we overlaid uh, the areas within the county that are also um, have been subject to and are built out as, as urban communities, as, as neighborhoods. And you'll see that the red areas here are, are scattered amongst the areas in Fallbrook and the Rancho Santa Fe areas and other areas that are in the unincorporated area but in fact are built out. Um, you take a look here at the green areas, and the green areas are part of a, an urban preserve system commonly referred to as the MSCP, which got a lot of news play during the past years. Um, that sits aside the largest urban preserve for plants and animal species anywhere in the United States that I'm aware of, and did so after seven to nine years of planning. It's 172,000 acres in total scope, and yet another one is being contemplated for, for North County, smaller in size, but. Uh, uh, to preserve important species as well, so that'll be up in these areas. The, um, the dark purple areas are those areas that were set aside uh, by initiative in the Cleveland National Forest. They were private lands in the Cleveland National Forest. They too went through a down zone. Again, the proponent of that initiative was Duncan McFetridge, uh, the author of Prop B. Um, the green areas, the big kind of greenish turquoise colored areas, are all the properties that are essentially held by government agencies or publicly owned lands, government owned. So it's about half of the entire county is owned by government. And uh, that includes obviously, you know, military installations and, and uh, bureau land management and parks and open spaces and things such as that that are held by public trust. Now, <laughs> the subject of the initiative are th these magenta colors. Um, and you can see their scope and is, uh, is vast. And that sets aside about 600,000 acres in all of the areas depicted um, by down zoning uh, land currently zoned as agricultural. As you can see, it's, uh, it doesn't leave a lot of, a lot of land to, uh, uh, to accommodate the kind of population growth that we're, we're projected to experience, again, principally from births. But that's not how the Sierra Club sees it. The Rural Heritage and Watershed Initiative is a good example of ways to say where growth should not go. Growth should not go in the watershed, growth should not go where there's no infrastructure, growth should not go where it's expensive to you know, put infrastructure out. Limiting growth in the back country, as, uh, as, uh, as it's called, will give us opportunity to plan in the future, if indeed 30 years from now we're still growing, to plan 
in that area, perhaps new towns or some forms of good planning which can accommodate the population. If we allow the kinds of two acres, four acres, eight acre developments in that area, we'll preempt areas that can be used much more efficiently and much more equitably in the future, 25, 30 years from now. And then it can be turned down or can be uh, 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 eliminated by the voters any time. So if the uh, county board of supervisors wanted to, to make another proposal, which also would protect agricultural lands in the back country, uh, two years from now they can go to the people and say, we feel this plan is better than what we have. To the farmers, Proposition B is a threat to their way of life. I think it'll have a devastating impact, and most of the farmers agree. That it, um, what it will do is, is um, since it devalues the property so severely, and the property is the asset that we use to finance expansion or to finance um, uh, short-term crop loans to get us through a bad year, I can guarantee you in, our, in every farming plan that we do, we, I can guarantee you that two out of ten years will be bad. You're just going to lose money. You can't make money every year. So you've got to be able to finance your way through the, through, the, through, the, through the bad years. Now, if you do that internally with your own savings or you do that by, with the equity that you've built up in your property, and you also use your property, your, the equity in your property to, um, to secure loans for a house, for a loan to, uh, uh, for ch uh, children to go to college, anything you want to do. It's, the, it's, our, it's our main asset. It's what we have. Well, there's one, one statement. Uh, to make here about that. No land in Southern California goes down in value. That, that is an absolute, we all know that. I, I'm astounded by that because I've only been in this business um, 20 years and I've seen property go up and go down, go up and go down twice or three times. I mean, I, <laughs> and I've seen housing, um, People lose their houses because the value of the house went below what they, they paid for it. It was called a recession. <laughs> so that's, that's just not true. We're opposed um, mainly because it would be so detrimental to our, far to our farmers. Um, it will devalue the property that they have um, worked so hard and put their sweat equity into. It will make it harder for them to pass their property on to their children. In other words, if a farmer had 100 acres and two children, and he's in the 80-acre zone, he can't pass it on a piece, half of it to each child. He would have to sell it and give away half money to each one. Um, it also uh, makes it harder for young farmers to get into the business because it tells them that to start up farming, they have to start with a 40 or an 80-acre parcel instead of a smaller one and work their way up. It also makes it harder for farmers to expand because what it says is that if you want to expand your operation, you've got to expand in 40 or 80 acre increments. And this is in a county where 65% of the farms are 10 acres or less. But to Duncan McFetridge, too often these agricultural lands become subdivisions. This used to be a, a cattle ranch, big cattle ranch out here, one of the many cattle ranches in Ramona that is up for development. And uh, they advertise this particular one as the great outdoors for sale. And that's what we're really uh, talking about with our initiative, that we have a heritage here which is not for sale. We have to respect it or we will lose it and we'll never get it back. If you accept that San Diego will grow to some degree, it will have to be accommodated somewhere. And if it can't be accommodated in the outlying areas, then it will be accommodated in our existing neighborhoods and communities. Unfortunately, Prop B doesn't do anything to improve upon the conditions of those existing communities. It simply forces that congestion upon them. So it forces the congestion to where you and I and others, our neighbors, live now without benefiting their schools or improving their roadways or making the key investments to make a better community. And that's the challenge with Prop B. The verdant hills of San Diego's north end between Del Mar and Rancho Bernardo have been at the center of the region's growth wars for two decades. The general plan of the 1970s had put aside much of this land for future development.
the future then being the 1990s. But as real estate interests chipped away at the plan, citizens revolted and started a growth management movement that resulted in the passage of Proposition A in 1985, ushering in a new era of planning by ballot. Any major shift in land use designation on the 12,000 acres known as the future urbanizing area must be approved by voters, and two such projects are on the ballot now. One is called Prop M, the Pacific Highlands Ranch Project, a proposed 5,000 homes to be built northeast of Carmel Valley. Pacific Highlands Ranch uh, is a plan that has been developed uh, around open space and the MSCP the multiple habitat uh, plan uh, as its uh, uh, core uh, and, and then uh, developed a, uh, a right-of-way for Route 56 uh, and then developed a village concept for housing uh, that uh, w was to be built, is to be built uh, in those areas that are not a part of the habitat planning area and that are not uh, uh, a part of where uh, Route 56 is proposed to go, which alignment was selected to support the habitat planning area. By designing a project with an eye on habitat, the Pardee Construction Company turned prior opponents, such as the Sierra Club, into allies. They made it clear what they wanted. And so our, our first baseline was a framework plan, design principles, and those included things like walkable communities, trails, um, for biking and hiking trails, um, connectivity with other areas, a certain level of um, clustering where you have open space in one area and then you have mixed use, you have business, residential and commercial all in the same area in a walkable, livable community. So it had to meet certain urban design principles. Pardee has clashed with environmentalists and neighborhood planning groups in the past, but after months of negotiations, they found common cause in the proposal for Pacific Highlands. This is their plan. Uh, this is a plan of the environmental groups and the, uh, and the neighbors. Uh, and uh, that's why it became habitat driven and that's why it became uh, 56 driven in terms of selecting an alignment that supported habitat and that's why it uh, uh, became linkage driven. Uh, and, uh, and neighbor driven and that's why it became uh, a, a different kind of community in terms of pedestrian orientation and transit orientation and all of those sorts of things because those are the groups that did the plan and uh, we think that at the end of the day the plan works for us uh, as well it is not the plan that we would have developed had we been responsible uh, for putting it together but a year and a half of uh, a lot of pretty interesting meetings uh, with, with all of these groups uh, has, has resulted in the compromise that's on the ballot. There was another key element to this agreement, the fate of Carmel Mountain, 150 acres of majestic property just east of Torrey Pine State Park, with the ocean views to the west, and even more important to environmentalists, it is home to many endangered plants and animals and could provide a critical link for regional habitat conservation. Pardee owns the land and planned to build houses there. The Sierra Club and others objected and refused to consider supporting the Pacific Highlands project unless Pardee put Carmel Mountain on the table. It's very valuable if you could build on it, but it's very valuable because it's a very endangered, sensitive place. And there was frankly, we, we had, um, you know, basically fought them politically to a standstill, um, but we still hadn't found a way to save it from the bulldozers. And so uh, part of the, the uh, opportunity with Pardee was to say, okay, we're not gonna just look at your project in the future urbanizing area, we're gonna look at these other issues, and can we find a way to save Carmel Mountain and you know, come up with a good development plan for your property? It is, uh, Pardee folded at a well considerable cost. The question of debt a colossal piece of property I and mean, it is absolutely uh, literally the crown jewel of, of the Pardee holdings. Uh, I remember walking out on that property the first day we began to look at it in 1979 and thinking what a magnificent site this would be for homes. Uh, it, was, it was approved for homes in the Carmel Valley Community Plan when we bought it uh, and for us to give that up is, is very 
very difficult. Saving Carmel Mountain may be enough for environmentalists, but not for others. To them, Prop M means traffic. We oppose Proposition M for a pretty simple reason. The zoning density in M will go from a maximum of 455 units under current zoning to 5,470 units if this ballot measure is approved. I don't think you have to be a rocket scientist or a brain surgeon to understand that the traffic problems that this will create for our already overburdened freeway and local street system is going to be unbelievable. We don't, we don't see any way out of it because the city has stated in, their, in the EIR on M that they recognize that there are many delays already existing of 15 minutes or more. This will have a, quote, significant impact, and yet it says that mitigation is beyond the scope of the applicant, i.e. Par D, or the city. Translation, nobody knows how to solve the problem. So it's our view at San Diegans for Responsible Freeway Planning that what we should be doing at this point is having the city, the county, the state, and the federal government in, get together in intense discussions and design and implement with adequate funding a regional traffic solution to these problems before we get into these what I call gargantuan projects, housing projects. Uh, now, as far as, as far as traffic is concerned, I think we're a part of the solution. Uh, we're, we're not a part of the problem. If you look at Caltrans numbers, Caltrans represents that uh, uh, traffic will be 20 percent less on I-15 south of Route 56 once 56 is built. Uh, if you look at the fact that uh, this plan includes building not only uh, 56 and, and we own over 100 acres of land that's going into Route 56 which we're, uh, which we're letting go for a lot less than uh, a, it's worth, and B, what any other property owner would let it go for. Uh, but we're but we're on the hook for the uh, the connectors, uh, so that uh, so that the traffic moves more smoothly off of 56 as well as on it. Uh, we're building the uh, the road infrastructure uh, through the area that isn't just 56. A lot of people spend a lot of time traveling north and south in San Diego right now, trying to get east and west. 56 is a critical element of getting east and west. That's why we're a part of the solution. The ballot language is, in our view, insidiously crafted, deceptively crafted. If you read the ballot language, there is not one mention of increased density in the Prop M ballot language. And surrealistically, they call it a transit-oriented community. Uh, this is not a high-density development. What it is uh, is clustered because a majority of the land is going to be dedicated, given to the city of San Diego, uh, as open space. Uh, and, and, and that particular kind of density is what drives this as a sort of a pedestrian transit-friendly community where uh, you don't have to get in your car uh, to uh, go to the supermarket uh, that you can get on your bike or you can walk and, and the corridors lead you there. I mean, it's designed in that notion. It's going to be an interesting challenge for us to test the marketplace uh, in terms of that new kind of community. But there are a lot of people who argue that, uh, that people do want to live that way. And it's one of the things uh, that I think makes this plan uh, unique. Another housing plan is also before the voters, Black Mountain Ranch, on the ballot as Proposition K, which would allow some 5,000 homes to be built just west of Rancho Bernardo. Gail McLeod, a longtime urban planner who works for Black Mountain, describes the context in which this project was developed. As I mentioned, that Prop A froze the zoning for all practical purposes at one unit to four acres. What? Um, um, what that meant was until about the early 90s, virtually nothing happened in the future urbanizing area. But starting in around 1990, it became economically feasible. The market was there to build out at one unit to four acres. So what the city and the citizenry saw was a checkerboard of little estate developments out there that did not respect uh, open space corridors, habitat, transportation corridors. 
So, so they said, wait a minute, let's put a moratorium in place. And the property owners and developers agreed to a moratorium. And let's take a look at this future urbanizing area. And let's do things differently. McLeod says Black Mountain Ranch meets progressive design principles. Uh, yes, this is a map showing subarea one, which is Black Mountain Ranch. And it's a 5,100 uh, 5, acres in total that you see here. And of our 5,100 acres, 3,000 acres will be devoted to open space, parks, and recreation. So on this graphic, what you're seeing is that everything that is green is park, open space, or recreation. And then the white areas are the development pods where uh, a variety of density of uh, development occurs. And again, it, it was the whole concept of having uh, maximi having a development that maximizes open space, the continuity of open space, and then identify specific development pods on which the development would occur. These plans may be attractive to some, but to David Kreitzer, a county planning commissioner and homeowner in Rancho Bernardo, they fall short. The Black Mountain Ranch project, um, I am opposed to the density that is proposed out there because the, uh, the density of the Black Mountain Ranch combined with the Forest Ranch, which is going before the County Board of Supervisors in early November, plus uh, projects that have already been approved out there, the Santa Fe Valley Project, uh, a specific plan, I should say, has been approved for about 12,800 homes. Uh, Christopher Hill, a small project uh, next to Forest R uh, Ranch, has been approved for 400 homes. And the combined effects of all these projects creates a, a, an intolerable traffic problem for the communities of Rancho Bernardo and Penasquitos and the I-15 corridor and Fairbanks Ranch. It's the traffic measure issue more than anything else. I realize that there's, there's the housing demand, but the, the traffic has not been addressed. We will not be able to build a single home in that voter approved phase until Freeway 56 is in, plus what's called sort of a dual freeway or free, freeway within a freeway, which um, is now under construction, which is, is expanding the portion of I-5 south of 56 to about 18 or 19 lanes from there down to the merge. So that the traffic impacts from our project will not hit the streets until 56 is in, these huge improvements on five, plus a variety of interchange improvements. And then, of course, we're also building all of these major roads that you see here. So we, it, again, it is unfounded to suggest that our residents will be impacting roads prematurely. They will be, in fact, phased to specifically tie into this new improvements. The monies that they are contributing will have to come in piecemeal because they can't they, uh, donate that kind of money or contribute that kind of money of $25 million until they have income generated by the sales of the homes. So it's kind of a chicken and egg thing. But the amount of money they are proposing, plus the money that, that the Forest Ranch is proposing to contribute, about $17 million, <clears throat> is largely for auxiliary lanes and ramp improvements. And this alone, all traffic engineers, I think, agree, city and county, will not address, and, and Caltrans, will not address the traffic problem on I-15. It's simply not adequate. What is needed for I-15 really is, is, a, is a much more expensive $250, $300 million upgrade of, uh, of the roads. This is a, uh, an illustration of the Northern Village and embodies the uh, clustered, mixed-use, uh, residential, employment, uh, commercial area within Black Mountain Ranch. It's uh, what is known in planning vernacular as a TOD, a transit-oriented development, or a compact community is another uh, way it's phrased. Uh, this is uh, com um, Camino del Norte, which is one of the major roads, and uh, another street going through here. Um, the densest residential area in this area with mixed use, a transit center uh, at this location, uh, that will enable uh, residents to get very quickly to the I-15 express bus corridor. We are working with MTDB and with uh, transit um, experts on that right now. We have a senior housing uh, here, 500 units of senior housing again, so that they're close to the commercial area. They can walk there easily. We have a whole system of pathways and walkways. This is a promenade area that cars are allowed there, but it's a very, very wide uh, street right-of-way that allows for uh, heavily landscaped uh, urban design features that 
uh, create a very walkable area. We have an employment center here. The high school sites um, and middle school site are at this location. This is a, a, an illustration of the housing that's in the western portion of our northern village. And it is actually part of the less dense portion, more of a single family home. But what it embodies is the alleyway with the garages off the alley alleyway so that the homes have that front porch type orientation to the street and is much more conducive to the walkable, livable neighborhood concepts. This illustrates the design guidelines that are part of our plan. They have some good ideas. They do. I'll give them credit for that. And uh, they are trying to make it uh, walkable, bicyclable, and that kind of thing. However, uh, and, and they would be able to bicycle to work if they work over in the, uh, in the uh, Forest Ranch Industrial Park or the Ranch Bernardo Industrial Park. However, the number of people who will be working in those parks, we don't know. It's probably relatively small. I mean, there are thousands working there now. Uh, and there's no assurance that those people are going to be, that park's going to be expanded, that, that those people who live in these two communities will simply work there. That's not the case. So we know now that the majority of the people who work in the Ranch Bernardo Industrial Park come from all over the city. And people who are going to buy and live in Black Mountain Ranch and Forest Ranch are probably going to do the same. They're going to be working in various places in the city. Now, in terms of the mass transit, the mass transit is going to be bus. We're not going to have any rapid transit up, up the I-15 in the foreseeable future. So it'll simply be additional bus service. And unless that bus service can take people to where they work, and people work in this county in, in employment pockets all over the county, Sorrento Valley, Mission Valley, downtown, Claremont, uh, you name it, uh, bus service isn't going to be the answer. To Carol and Chase, Prop K, like Prop M, meets Sierra Club standards for responsible planning. Both of these propositions um, are examples of where What's, it's, this is the hardest thing for people to understand, is that how could do it, developing something be better for the environment than developing nothing? Well, then you have to understand that developing nothing is not an option. <laughs> so it's just simply not an option. For years, we argued with Pardee and Black Mountain Ranch. We worked to stop bad development up there. It was just a battle royal. Uh, but you can't stop a development unless you can purchase the property. You can't purchase the property unless you can have a willing seller. Developers are not willing sellers. So they're going to develop something up there. And even if we could raise the money, they wouldn't sell. So then the question is, how do you do it well? And I think that has to be of paramount importance. If we're going to have livable cities, we have to understand how are we going to have places where people can live to reduce pollution? Can they live there without a car? Can they be designed well? Can they commute on public transit? Um, you know, all these issues are important. One land use proposition that has no opposition that we could find is Proposition N, explained here like by Richard Roberts. It's a land swap. It's a swap of land out of uh, a, uh, a, a very delicate uh, area, uh, the lagoon area uh, that is up by the racetrack. A swap of that land, which is currently owned by a developer, uh, for a piece of land that is owned by the city of San Diego. And uh, if that swap goes through, if this proposition is approved, then we will be able to preserve that 47 acres in the San Diego River Park uh, as perpetual open space, uh, and the developer will be able to take advantage of his development rights on the piece of property uh, that is at the end of Nobel Drive uh, adjacent to 805. A compromise, a solution where, as it appears now, everybody wins. The real estate partnership takes title of property zoned for industry, and the city gets an asset that is priceless to complete the regional habitat corridors and protect the land from housing tracks forever. All of the propositions that we covered tonight require you, as a voter, to assume the role of urban planner in charting the future of our region. While planning by ballot may not be the ideal way to decide complex land use matters, in these cases, we have no choice. Your views are important, and we urge you to express those views by casting your vote on November 3rd. I'm Shannon Bradley of UCSD-TV. Thank you, and good night.
UCSD TV has joined with Citizens Coordinate for Century 3, the region's oldest nonpartisan civic organization, to produce Path to Paradise as a way to start a conversation about the future of our region. If you would like more information about C3, please call 619 232 7196. To let us know your thoughts about regional planning, call UCSD TV at 619 534 7076 or email us at UCSDTV at UCSD.edu. Funding for Path to Paradise is provided in part by Solomon Smith Barney, a global investment bank with offices around the world, including Carlsbad, La Jolla, Rancho Santa Fe, and two in the city of San Diego. Solomon Smith Barney is a leading underwriter of municipal bonds in the U.S. and stands ready to help all San Diego area municipalities with their tax-exempt financing needs. And by Public Financial Management Incorporated, America's leading financial and investment advisors to state and local governments. Since 1975, PFM has been proud to play a role in financing the facilities that make San Diego County a better place to live, work, and travel.